Hello, and welcome to Introduction to Psychology. I am Benjamin Miss. Here is our overview. What are we trying to learn here? Well, the major concepts and the big components of what are the various parts of psychology. It's a really large field that covers a lot of territory. In addition, we want to consider what is special about psychology and what makes it a science. So our general goals are these, right? I mentioned we've got a lot of areas. So these are like the different perspectives. We mentioned the science aspect. Extremely important to consider what are the aspects involved. And we want to apply these things to research. One of the things I will attempt to do frequently is to bring in research and say, here's what they found. What does it mean? We want to understand the methods by which data is collected and that we know what we know. A lot of people have various ideas about what psychology is, and many people think of themselves as having some basic understanding of human psychology. But what does it really mean for us as a field? Well, these are the major topics, and obviously this is a, a large area, and each one of these could be an entire semester worth of coursework. Each one of these could be a graduate class or even a field of study at that level. In fact, some places have multiple psychology programs. At UCI, for instance, they have cognitive science, psychology, psychological science, neuroscience, and the education department has a focus in psychology. There's also child development, language. These are all things that are often considered to be components. And often we say, what's the difference between these? You have to look very carefully at the different schools and the different programs and say, what are these focuses? The point is, psychology is a giant area that is split into very interesting areas of focus. For many people who are coming into an Introduction to Psychology class, we look at one of the other things, which is the application. How can we use what we know to actually improve your grades, to improve your life? Something that has been an area of recent study is called mindset, which other words that have been, you know, meant similar things over time have been attitude or locus of control. What mindset is, is the idea that there's two ways of looking at the world that people have. One is called fixed mindset, and one is called growth mindset. People with fixed mindset say, oh, I failed this test. I'm no good at this. I'm going to stop trying. People with growth mindset say, oh, I didn't do as well as I wanted to. What can I do differently? What, was, what, you know, what were the components here? People with fixed mindset believe that they can't change, that your abilities are your abilities. And many people have this. You were taught perhaps that you were either good at something or you weren't. But growth mindset is the truth of the matter. We know as a fact that as an adult, your brain is capable of changing. Every time you put new information in, your brain itself literally changes. There's differences in the configuration of your neurons. And so when we look at this idea of growth versus fixed mindset, we know that people with fixed mindset are going to have a harder time, are going to be less successful. People with growth mindset are going to do better because they reach an obstacle and they don't give up as easily. Right? There's a persistence there. You will not be surprised to know that people with fixed mindset don't succeed as well in school, are more likely to drop out, and that people with growth mindset are much more likely to be successful, not just in school, but in whatever they choose to do. Another thing we can apply is a very common area of note-taking. And in note-taking, we look at uh, what's called Cornell notes. Now, one of the things that happens in sometimes some schools is students are taught to write down everything, right? So it's like, here's this word, here's the definition, it's going to be on the test. Usually when you get to the higher levels of education, it no longer works that way. You get out what you put in. A psych major might learn more from a psych and intro psych class simply because 
they know they're going to need that information. They're going to want it, and they're going to do what's called overlearning and make sure that that information is in. Someone who's taking it just to enjoy it might not learn quite as much. But what we end up with is we are not going to all be filtering through the same material, which means when you come across something, you write it down. When you come across something interesting, you cannot write down everything on the slides. You cannot write down every word that I say. Fortunately, this is a recording, and that means that you can re-view and re-watch. But this also goes into how to study. And another area of study is frequently testing yourself. Not writing your notes, not rewriting your notes, but saying, what did I learn? And what do I still not know from what happened? You write down questions you have. You email your professor. You write down areas that you want to further investigate so that you can do better. And when we look at how we do, trial and error is reasonable. We are going to make mistakes. And just like in fixed and growth mindset, we want to consider people we consider, uh, we think of as extremely successful. And we have to know that success is, uh, they call it like um, kind of a survivor's bias, right? People who have achieved great success, the ones especially that started with nothing, faced failure over and over again. Failure is part of the process and part of the learning process. Not that I want you to fail, but I want you to understand that a failure can be simply getting a question wrong that you thought you had studied for, not failing a test or a class. And that means that we are going to, to see this. Learn how to do our notes. This is a little bit about me. My name is Benjamin Miss. I prefer to be called Ben. And if people call me Benjamin, I just assume they don't know me. Um, and uh, many students will call me Dr. Ben. I started my education at Palm Beach Community College, and I finished it at University of California, Irvine, uh, where I have my, my doctorate. Uh, at Irvine Valley College, I teach intro regularly, physio, psych, cognition, stats, language acquisition, developmental psych, and some independent research classes. Independent research is extremely important. My interests are in research, biopsych, linguistics, and uh, language acquisition, a number of areas here. Um, we look at our written assignments. There will certainly be assignments and quizzes and grading, and this will all be available in Canvas and the syllabus. And we want to consider uh, some stuff that's true for the classroom, but is also true for our online classes too, which is this, right? Distraction. How many people are doing other things while they're learning? We know that distraction is bad and students want to try to try to balance, but they kind of tune out, right? You get a little distracted. You've paid attention for five, 10 minutes and you're done. They always say every generation doesn't have an attention span. I think they blame YouTube and cell phones for yours. They blamed MTV for mine. People just don't have great attention spans. And we're not aware of much of the world around us. This is something we'll learn in psychology. Uh, but something that we want to consider right away is the work of Simons and Cerise, where we see that they actually can swap out one person with another by having a person duck down to get something and another person come up behind a desk. People don't notice. They did the famous gorilla experiment, where they had people tossing basketballs to each other and a gorilla walk through the scene, and people didn't recognize it. People didn't notice it happening. So even we're paying attention, we're going to miss things. When we distract ourselves, we do even more poorly. This is the same reason why maybe you were driving recently and you saw a car starting to swerve lanes. How likely is it that the driver of that car was texting or doing something else? We are very poor. Um, in fact, multitasking is a misnomer. Some people can switch attention between tasks pretty easily, but not well. Now the companion text for what we're going to be talking about is called OpenStax. This is a free PDF that you can uh, also get a hard copy of online, but you can download it right now by going uh, by searching OpenStax Psychology, and this is the second edition of the book.
it's an excellent book and it's just as good as any of the ones that you'll pay hundred dollars or more for um, in class we use index cards colored index cards and it goes like this and all might have questions like this in our online slides too which would be why why are we using index cards well the value of it is in testing ourselves and remember I said students often study wrong and they study wrong because they think that well we don't need to to test ourselves we're just going to read this we're going to memorize this but when you memorize you're doing something different than when you're testing and the only way to really know what's in your brain is to pull it out by testing so when I ask these questions do your best to answer and get an idea of where you are well our goals for the first segment right is what is psychology why is it a science and who are some of the key figures in history and if I ask you um, you know who's the number one person that comes to mind when you think of psychology most students are going to say Freud which is fine now Freud is not the uh, best scientist uh, not the most you know influential currently in terms of the fields but one of the things we do see is that what Freud did was he brought psychology to a wider audience and we will talk about him right um, and why he's important in the history of psychology well psychology gives us you know the the study of the psyche and psyche is like soul essence of life mind breath it's like the Greek term that means all of these kind of all these different things they didn't really have a separate way of thinking about this and so oftentimes the idea of mind and soul are intertwined what's different from the meat of the brain than from you know what you think of as yourself um, the study of psyche and eros comes from psyche and eros comes from this um, uh, you know ancient myth where psyche was uh, you know uh, is, is mind and, and eros is is heart and it's about kind of like the merging of these two two things and the difficulty of these the psyche was beautiful couldn't find a mate was told by the oracle that she was destined to meet a hideous hideous looking man uh, ends up with eros but is not allowed to see his face and one night she sneaks a look and he and she is banished and then has to perform all these tasks to get back to love right the mind working to achieve love it's an interesting story but it does give us an idea of what is psyche and what is the ancient idea of this and for thousands of years we've been trying to merge our mind and our emotions and to understand who we are and one of the early things we'll do is look at the history of studies of the mind that go back before the birth of psychology putting psychology into a much more you know enduring perspective uh, in a lot of ways it's the modern application or started as, as a modern application as the philosophy of mind plus scientific method and so the purpose of psychology is to describe predict understand and influence human behavior and this is often broken up into different parts of psychology well I'd like to start with the discussion of what's called Plato's cave and Plato's cave is this and, and let me show you an image of it there's a lot of words here but I'll, I'll describe it while I show you the, the kind of the idea so in Plato's cave you have prisoners that have been chained to the wall chained facing the wall since birth they can only look at the wall in front of them they can't see anything else and so all they see on the wall is shadows and all they hear is these you know sounds that are echoes and people will walk on this kind of raised area carrying things and this will show the shadows in the wall and just like in our world if you were to predict what came next if a person could predict what came next they would be considered wise and that would you know be basically the way we see things too and in in Plato's view you know we are the the prisoners right we only see these things now for Plato if a prisoner were freed they would view the things in the real world as less than the shadows on the wall 
And they, you know, if you take the person up into the world, you show them all these things, they might have trouble adjusting. But once they adjusted, they would then be in our world. And if you brought them back and they try to tell people what they saw, people would think of them as a fool. Well, Plato's message was that the philosophers are the, um, are the person who sees the truth and comes back. But there's some really interesting modern pieces to this, right? Because one, if you were raised in this dark environment, you might never see color, right? You might never perceive it, uh, no matter what you saw in the world. And from a modern perspective, the way that I look at the cave is we are the prisoners of the cave because what we see, what we experience is not truth. What we experience is what our senses allow us to which means we know there is this massive world. We know as a fact, right? We accept that this physical things, even our physical bodies, are mostly empty space. Our atoms and electron clouds and, and protons and neutrons. And yet, we know this because we have these detectors and sensors for them. But there are still people who believe wildly incorrect things because we're looking at our sense information. It is certainly not reality that we perceive. In fact, we can very easily see how it is not reality that we perceive. For instance, do we perceive objective truth? Well, how is your sense of smell compared to the sense of smell of a dog? Quite poor. How is your sense of hearing compared to a dog or a bat? Also quite poor. What about your vision compared to, for instance, a bird or a butterfly? And don't even start with a mantis shrimp. Well, once again, quite poor. Do we detect magnetic fields like birds and sharks? Do we detect electrical fields like some fish? The idea is there are many things in this world that we know we do not perceive. And yet some other species may have some way of sensing these things. What this tells us is we absolutely don't perceive objective truth. The electromagnetic spectrum, our visual area is tiny compared to microwaves and radio waves and gamma waves, which are all light in some form that we simply do not perceive. So we look at, we know we don't see reality. We are the prisoners sensing these shadows on the wall and trying to make sense of them. And in a lot of ways, this makes psychology the purest of the sciences. For instance, without a mind, do we even have math or chemistry? If we understand the mind better, might we understand the limitations of it, which might allow us to unlock some areas of science by saying, hey, we're not perceiving this. Maybe we should look. Well, we look at why things are a science and the cartoon here from XKCD also tells us that there's some interesting um, blind spots that we have. Think about the, the character here who something looks a certain way, so they just accept it as truth. Well, in the same way, the major application of psychology being used for evil today is what people can you know, talk about as, as fake news. They've learned for years that if you keep repeating the same lie over and over, people eventually start to accept it. And from other areas of psychology, we know that if something fits your worldview, we're very likely to accept it as true without even questioning it. Wildly incorrect things. Well, what psychology gives us and why it's a science are it allows us to test hypotheses and think about why things are the way they are. I mentioned that psychology grew out of the philosophy of the mind adding the scientific method. And we look at these great questions of philosophy, which we're still asking in psychology. Do we perceive reality? What is the relationship between mind and brain? Nature nurture, right? Which is the interaction between genes and the environment. What has a greater effect? And then of course, the great questions of good and evil. What is the human nature? Well, we look at these, we say, what's the data? The goal here is not to tell you what to think, but to look at the data and to say, what does this tell us about human nature, about the mind, the brain? 
In fact, even when we look at the last question here, words like good and evil, those are not the ones we want, because what do they mean? We'd in instead use words like pro-social and selfish. In fact, for selfish, we might even say antisocial, because antisocial is another one of those words where the pop psych idea is it means you just like to be by yourself. But in psychology, right, the scientific definition is against society, right? People who are likely to commit crimes, end up in prison, violence. We're pro-socials, the people who are helping. Well, tying it in a little more recently, right, we go back, you know, 2,400 years to Plato. And then we look at the more recent areas, right, um, the rationalists, the empiricists. These are still hundreds of years of philosophy, but it's the debate between nature and nurture. And the rationalists and, and empiricists, remember this is psychology, uh, philosophy, not psychology, but it links to areas that are there, right? Rationalists look at the innateness, our nature, right? Our nativism. What do we have ingrained? The empiricists look at what do we learn, right? What exists only through sense experience. And some of our famous rationalists include Descartes. And one of those things that you just have to know is Descartes' uh, cogito ergo sum, which means I think, therefore I am. Often derided by philosophers, it is still a key component of our history and our understanding of the mind, where Descartes attempted to say, if I knew nothing, what could I know for certain? if I couldn't trust my senses. And that's what's interesting. Descartes was asking the same questions that we are, which is, can I trust reality? Do I sense truth? We look at the empiricists. And here we have, for instance, Locke, famous, his famous phrase, tabula rasa. Tabula rasa meaning blank slate. Arguing that humans are born a blank slate, and everything we learn is through sense experience. There is nothing there and this links on with some modern views and we will look at these in some kind of great debates these philosophers were kind of foreshadowing the great debates here nativism versus behaviorism right the kind of cognitive side of what is the structure of the mind what does it predispose us to this is the behaviorists which are everything is learned and we think about the political implications if you believe that everything is learned right, that we are blank slates, and somebody commits crimes. Well, who's responsible for that, right? Clearly, society failed. If you believe that everything's innate, right, that we are, um, you know, born with our personalities and our drives and our pro-social or anti-socialness, well, if somebody commits a crime, we're like, throw away the key, this is clearly a bad person. So the idea is looking at this, or education. If everyone's a blank slate, then certainly education is where we should be investing versus we have these general abilities we also look at things like depression mental illness how would we treat depression if it was learned how would we treat it if it was innate well if it's learned what would you do perhaps therapy perhaps try to decondition right or recondition if it's innate you might think medication or other types of you know medical interventions so you see how these things kind of fit. Our very way we interact with the world links back to our very beliefs about human nature and about the mind. And that's all psychology. That's all things we can look at in terms of what is human behavior. Well, this philosophy, remember, art not psychology, argues we can know the world through reason alone. Rationalism, empiricism, pragmatism, or psychology? And the answer is rationalism. This philosopher believes each human is born a tabula rasa, or blank slate. And this was Rene Descartes, William James, Herman Ebbinghaus, or John Locke? The answer is John Locke. We've only talked about two of these so far. The other two we will talk about, other figures in early psychology. And same question from uh, answers from earlier. This philosophy is close to it's related to the concept of nurture, and the answer is empiricism. And pragmatism is something that we will also discuss soon, a 
very early American philosophy. Well, we also look at reasoning in terms of that are associated with innateness and learning, and these are inductive and deductive reasoning. Very useful terms because they're also associated with things like uh, top-down and bottom-up processing, something, a process of the mind. It's a modern thing investigated. Basically, do we, when we enter into a situation, how much of the information are we taking in and making a judgment based simply on the information? How much of the information are we filtering based on our expectations about the world? Well, our inductive is we think of the direction in. We take in information and we try to understand it. Well, deductive is to say, well, we know this about, we know this, what can we, what can we then figure out? Well, here is our pragmatism, and it's associated with a with uh, Pierce, an interesting and problematic figure. Um, Charles Pierce, for his failings, did have a very interesting view of experimentation. The idea being one of the early psychology um, investigations of saying, well, we certainly have to trust our sense experiment experience, but we also have to be able to make predictions about the world. And there were some great failures here, right? So, for instance, there's a famous uh, belief by Aristotle that if you dropped two objects, the heavier one would fall faster. When you have wind resistance, certainly a feather will fall much slower than a, a rock. But this experiment has been replicated in zero gravity, and it's uh, without wind resistance, and it's shown that they do fall at the same speeds, which is so surprising. But Aristotle based this bait, his, his, his belief based on observation. It wasn't until, um, you know, the, the 1500s that somebody said, hey, let's actually test this. And I know Galileo gets credit, but I think it was X who did it. Um, the idea is beliefs may be wrong. We have to verify them. We can observe the world and say, yeah, this is what I think is happening. And when we observe the world, we create an explanation for things. But we still have to accept that we could be wrong. Our biases, our attention. We're simply not, not picking up on something that's important. This is very useful. When we look at psychology, we're going to look at uh, some very influential figures. And um, the idea is that the early ideas of uh, voluntarism is the mind creates more complex mental elements and the will is superior to intellect and emotion. So this is an attempt to understand the different components of the mind. And it's very rudimentary, thinking, well, we've got the will, we've got intellect, and we've got emotion. And it is our will that is kind of creating the more interesting things. Well, this comes from a couple of interesting uh, pieces of history. So we start with Wundt. Wilhelm Wundt was a, um, a researcher and really is considered to be the first psychologist. And the birth of psychology being when his lab started to publish results. Well, what he did was he, he took an apparatus made from a clock and he saw he would basically have people look at the pendulum and play a tone. He would ask them, where is the pendulum when you hear this? Well, what he found was that it took people from hearing the tone to observing the pendulum a tenth of a second a hundred milliseconds, which is an eternity in the mind. And this is interesting because people just kind of assume that things are automatic. And yet we can actually measure how long it takes us to process things. This was a big deal because in order to do this task, you had to process the sound and then what you're looking at. Well, Wundt also had an interesting view because his studies were in biology and he was interested in human consciousness. And chemists had recently started to describe the periodic table of elements based on different elements and their molecular weights and, atom and atoms and protons. And he noted that all physical entities, right, well, they're made up of elements. And so you've got these uh, molecules that are made up of elements. What if the mind has some basic thought elements that combine to form the molecules of experience. Very interesting idea, right? Wrong, 
but cool because we're talking this guy's 150 plus years ago 100 and, yeah more than that and thinking about how this applies and what is the structure of the mind and big debates come from there another area that i want to uh give you is the early ebbinghaus uh, experiments on memory because this is an area where you can absolutely apply this directly to your performance. How? Well, Ebbinghaus did experiments on himself. He gave himself lists of nonsense syllables, so meaningless syllables, because he knew that meaningfulness would influence memory. We often chunk things together by associations. So he tested on himself. And he showed something that holds up to this day, and you know that is entirely correct, which is the forgetting curve. So how quickly do we forget things, and how do we learn? Well, one term that we want to consider is overlearning. When you teach somebody something, you know how they say like teaching is the best way to learn something. When you teach somebody something, you're doing engaging in this process where you're learning past the point needed for maybe what you need for doing well on your test. But you're actually creating this level of mastery that allows you to hold on to that information. Meaningfulness, we said, was linking things together. And then here's one that we have known for, again, since Ebbinghaus, and this is 140 years nearly, 130, 140 years. Cramming is not a good idea. This is distributed versus massed practice. Ebbinghaus in the 1800s demonstrated clearly that it is better to spread out learning than to do it all at once. So come on, study every day. And this is how the forgetting curve works. Now you've also had this experience and for you fixed mindset people out there, this is where you say, I don't, I'm not gonna bother, it's too hard. Well, savings. You ever study something and then you put your book away, you study for an hour, put your book away and go about your day. And the next day you're studying again and you're like, I have no memory of what I studied. It's totally normal. Savings is when you start looking at the stuff again, it doesn't take you an hour to get it. It takes you maybe 10 minutes, right? And all of a sudden you've learned it a lot better. Savings is the time it takes to relearn. Now I'd like you to look at the next slide and write down what you see and ignore what you know. Do you understand? Just write down what you see, ignore what you know. I want the basics. What we're looking at here is two things that we can kind of focus on, the immediate and the immediate. Well, Levant described the immediate as what are the basic building blocks of this experience, right? We would look at the colors and the shape, the basic components, right? The little, the little yellowy dots, you know, the green at the top and the mostly red with some yellowy and this, you know, brown thing. But what happens is when we experience something, we do the immediate, which is maybe you thought about the taste that's not part of your visual sense experience, but it's something that we're reflecting on, or how it crunches, something that goes beyond, or even the name of the thing. Well, Wundt uh, is, is linked with the birth of psychology, 1879 being when research began to emerge from his lab, and the explosion of modern psychology around this time. You know, Freud was making his mark in the early 1900s, not much later, William James was working around the same time. So we had a, a lot of interesting things happening in a fairly short period of time. And so what Wundt and Titchener and his people were doing was what's called experimental introspection. Remember elements and molecules? Can we get the elements of thought and experience? So let's do the same thing we did with the first slide on this slide. All right, I want you to write down what you see, what you experience. Try to avoid the immediate. Try to just go with the immediate. 
How do we describe this differently? Well, the color is different. The shape is different. Maybe the reflections are different. And yet, even then, when we think about our immediate experience, we immediately have this idea of, does this one taste different? Does it, do we experience it differently? So, Vunt and Titchener argued that we should avoid describing things of past experience, just talk about the experience, and that's how we can build up these molecules. But we would actually let the impressions affect us, let our memories affect us. And this was the problem with this. They call this stimulus error, right? Not looking at the stimulus, but looking at how we feel about it, our memories. And this was the problem with structuralism, right? Structuralism was concerned with these, how these elements of mind create these molecules. And yet, what are the elements of mind? How can we say, I'm going to forget everything I know and just go with this picture? It's impossible. And that's the issue, right? You'd present the stimuli and measuring in this experiment, experience. Now, it doesn't work, but it's still a good idea, right? It still was an interesting idea. And Titchener has some interesting ideas. Like, we use these all the time, like a Likert scale, like how much you like something, right? How much you feel about something or how much you agree with something. Strongly disagree, disagree, agree, strongly agree. Well, this dimension, right? And, and try to look at dimensions of experience. So structuralism grew out of voluntarism, where voluntarism was about the will, but structuralism was about the structure based on the elements. So what are the elements of the mind? And both studied the subconscious and conscious. And you know, we're looking at the pieces that are under the surface, right? Elements versus the experience as a whole. On the other side of the Atlantic, really, and looking at a different direction was William James, the most influential American psychology uh, psychologist. And he would argue with Funt that the psychological fallacy is believing all people experience the same stimuli are also having the same mental experience. Uh, the stream of consciousness, substantive thought versus focused uh, versus transitive thought, where you have your focused attention, your substantive thought, and your transitive thought, which is your mind wandering. In fact, modern ways of looking at the mind also consider these things, where you look at how much of our time is spent in focused attention and how much of our time is spent with a wandering mind. Which psychologist studied memory and gave us the forgetting curve? Was it Ebbinghaus, Wundt, Titchener, or James? And it was Ebbinghaus. Which psychologist first compared mental elements to physical elements? Same options, and it was Wundt. Now, what we look at uh, with James is kind of some of his influence here. Um, there was a lot of very powerful influence, and um, he went to, to work with uh, Hermann von Hemholtz briefly. Um, Wundt also did, and Wundt was far more in, in, involved, and um, what happened was uh, one of the one of the debates may be that that James wanted to work with Funt and Hemholtz, and it was difficult to do so, right, um, for for various reasons. When James went to went to Europe and, and worked, you know, looked for them, James began teaching at Harvard in 1875, and he was an MD. And he says that the first lecture on psychology I ever heard was the first he gave. So basically, he was starting when there wasn't a thing. And when we look here at this image, this was an image from James's uh, Seminal Principles of Psychology, which was published in 1890. James spent over a decade working on this, attempting to reach a perfect, a perfection, a perfect psychology textbook, a giant two-volume tome, and yet. It's still pretty good. The anatomy stuff is still good. Like he was really ahead of his time. He was looking at like what do we have support for evidence, perceptual stuff, incredible work. A little heavy on the philosophy, and that was part of the debate between James's functionalism and um, Funt's structuralism. So here you're looking to look at the 
brain states that make up conscious experience, looking at what is the function rather than the elements. And you look at the study of consciousness, right, and where James's criticisms are, which is, well, we know the brain states that make up conscious experience, but does that help us understand conscious experience? There's a lot of philosophical aspect here, which you would expect in an early science. Consider this. If we could look at your brain right now, every neurotransmitter, every synapse, and see what's happening, and we could take a perfect picture of this, and then recreate it a month from now, a year from now, would you have the exact same experience you're having right now? This is part of the understanding of the brain states and our experiences, our conscious experiences. So looking at the general functions of things, James does delve into the philosophical and have battles with, with Vunt about their, their things, right? Um, you know, structuralism was criticized for being too subjective. And we saw the issues with it in experimental introspection, which is, well, you can't just ignore your experiences. You can't ignore what you know. And this leads to the gestalt, which is part of the modern approach. And you look at criticisms of James functionalism, where Vunt said it's literature, it's beautiful, but it's not psychology, right? And there were these different directions. And this is still a way of, of kind of understanding how we view things. These two directions, right, are getting into the details versus looking at the big picture. The mind is so incredibly complicated. There are those that believe that it can't even be understood because you've got the details, all these detailed pieces, what's happening in the brain right now versus the big picture. What is your experience and why is your experience special? What makes you special? Now, we haven't mentioned any women yet, and there's some, well, unsettling reasons for this, which is in the early 20th century, when psychology was really growing quickly, it was believed that women were inferior. Uh, this comes from Darwin's idea, which is, you know, you look at his, his Darwin's experience, he was part of a, a wealthy, well-educated family, right? And his cousins were also wealthy and well-educated, and the people in science were those who were wealthy and well-educated. So when they looked at why are, what's this variability? Well, some men, all they're doing is, is labor and some men are, are working with, with science. So clearly there's this huge variability in men and women are all the same. They're at home, they're having babies, they're doing, you know, women house things. So this way that the things were wasn't really, didn't really make it available. I mean, when we look at great women from this, this era, they were an, an anachronism. They were a surprise and often derided and, and, um, um, and punished. Well, Darwin's variability hypothesis comes also from the prejudice of those who were educated, also happened to be wealthy, and ignoring the fact that there were, you know, a myriad of talented, intelligent people who simply were born in an, a, a station where they couldn't achieve those things. Um, in fact, we look at the rapid growth of, of science and it's in this kind of giving access to people. There are great minds and there are still to this day likely great minds uh, growing up in poverty without access to education. Yet it's far less than it was in the past when children, you know, these great minds were being stuck into mines and factories. Now, what's interesting also is James was uh, very positive about this. Um, and he fought for Calkins. This is uh, uh, Mary Witten Calkins, who was one of the early presidents of the American Psychological Association, you know, the organization in psychology, right? The number one. And so uh, Mary Calkins got her, well, did her work at Harvard with James, but was refused a degree because, well, women being inferior and all that. And so she ended up getting hired from uh, and working at Columbia um, and developing her own lab and focused on the consciousness and developed some interesting methods, right? Now, there's nothing 
you know, really influential about Kalkins's work, but we remember her for one of the battles we uh, that were fought at this at this time period. But she did bring some interesting things to the table. Highly intelligent, good experimental methods, and yet was again a surprising case because of the prejudices against women at the time period and how hard uh, they had to fight in order to be, you know, to have an opportunity. So we don't now in modern psychology, as we start to talk about from week to week some of the areas, we will certainly talk about some more women who have had massive influences there. And we also can look at this and say, things have changed a lot in a hundred years. This doesn't mean we're done. It doesn't mean that there's equality, but it does mean that we look at this and we see how much things were different at that time period. Um, and in a lot of ways, psychology was one of the more progressive areas. So, the gestalt is the whole is more than the sum of its parts. Consciousness cannot be reduced to mental elements. Well, the phenomenon here is the turning off and turning on of each of these. So if you've seen this where one, one light or one circle flashes on at a time. And what happens is we tend to see movement. We perceive it as movement. Right, right now, the top one in the middle has turned off, and then as we go, they'll take turns turning on and off. And what this tells us is we are adding something to it, and our um, illusions, we do a lot of this with, right? We add things. Anytime there's an illusion, this is our minds adding something that's not there. Well, Gestalt was interested in this, right? Gestalt was interested in this kind of, the, the, when we think of Gestalt, the, the phrase, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, is the, the key piece. So we look at um, four terms here. I'm going to show you examples of proximity, similarity, closure, and pregnant. So let me show you these four things so you get an idea, because the images, I think, are going to be more helpful than the description. So same number of dots on the left and on the right. Right, we've got six rows by six rows, but on the right we've put some space. And so we see it as three objects rather than one. Proximity, close items being grouped. Um, similarity, similar items are grouped. Right, so here we see at the top left uh, circles surrounded by triangles, but we see a triangle made out of circles. And then we see the two items below where it's a little bit odd. Um, it's hard to see them as single objects. We look at closure, where groups of objects are seen as a whole. Well, we create this kind of line um, at the top of the white for the bear, for the World Wildlife Federation symbol. And then Prangnans is the law of simplicity, right? We see this as five rings, right? Like the Olympic rings. Well, why don't we see it as you know, four or five, four football looking things and five partial things. Why don't we see it that way? Well, we could, but we go for the simple. Um, Gestalt gives us the idea of insight learning. And so you look at these four stages, the preparation, incubation, illumination, and verification. Do you ever have that you're studying something and the answer just comes to you or you're trying to figure out a problem or whatever it is that you're, that you're doing and Boom, the solution's there, right? Trial and error doesn't work. A lot of times you take a break. What do you do? Some people might take a nap or take a shower or go for a run. And this incubation period just allows your, your what it tells us is the mind is still working on solving the problem. And then the illumination, and then you test it. And one of the keys here is, um, you know, many great things have come about that way. Uh, Maybe you've ever, you know, post-it notes, those little sticky things. Well, that came about because they developed this glue they didn't know what to do with. A researcher at 3M happened to be, they'd, they'd been developing this glue. It was, like, interesting because it didn't leave a residue, and it was not super sticky. And he's sitting in church, and he's trying to get his bookmark to stick in the hymnal, and it keeps falling out. And he's getting annoyed, and then it just pops into his head. Hey, this would be an interesting use. Post-its, right? 
and uh, the original yellow color was because there was a lot they had a lot of scrap yellow paper available to them and when they put together their test pads that was the color and they liked them it's interesting how things how things work that way we look at insight learning in these remote associations tests which is also uh, used as a predictor of creativity and insight so each of these eight um, lists of three words groups of three words contains one word that ties them all together and we look at for instance falling actor dust what's one word that's associated with all three and if you'd like to try these out on yourself this would be a good place to hit pause because i'm going to give you the answers now each of these words is associated with those three then we look at rebus puzzles you might have seen these right so what do we um uh how do we put these things together? So you look at these and you try to figure out what, what does this mean? Here are some simpler ones. For instance, what's the answer to this? People would say top secret or this one, which would be shut up and sit down. So we're looking at how we're kind of like putting things together and solving puzzles. And the idea is trial and error doesn't work. We have kind of let our minds relax and take in the information and try to figure out what it is. Well, what is not part of the four stages of insight learning? Is it verification, incubation, trial and error, or preparation? And the answer is trial and error. That was not one of the four parts. And then, which is not a Gestalt principle? Closure, similarity, structure, or pregnancy? And the answer is structure. Well, what the Gestalt brought was the idea that there's, there's insight learning and how would you use structuralism to get there? How would you use Wundt's structuralism to describe insight learning? You can't, right? Because what would be the elements? You know, so here we've got this molecule of insight. Well, what are the elements? And the answer is it's impossible to know. There's something special happening in the mind. But criticizing Gestalt was like criticizing James's functionalism. How do you test this? Where's the scientific rigor? And you can do better. Well, now we want to consider the major modern perspectives. And we're going to go through these and look at what these approaches are. So um, in our next video, we will look through these modern approaches and start here. So I hope you've enjoyed this brief introduction and we will talk more soon.